Of all the gravy assignments, work release is the graviest. At least that's what I would have said until about a week ago. If you're unfamiliar with how the prison hierarchy works, let me explain. You have maximum security institutions, places with barbed wire on the fences, and men in cages inside of concrete structures, whose days are basically dictated by the guard's will. Then you have minimum security, which is mostly dorms that look like summer camp cabins with bunk beds and belongings stacked neatly in lockers. Inmates who have a schedule and go about their day as they choose, within reason. Then there's community custody, which is more like a halfway house. Inmates living in community custody have jobs outside the facility, earn their own money, and get to wear regular clothes most of the time. They have one foot in the real world and usually cause very little trouble. This post is deemed too dull for most officers, but after three years of running and gunning at Stragview, I was ready for something boring. The major that runs the Midnight Ridge work camp was a friend of mine, and he heard I was looking for a change and decided to make me part of his team. So I put in my transfer, waited my customary three months for the wheels of bureaucracy to turn, and finally got my transfer. I thought that after three years of hassle and bullcrap, I had finally arrived at a sort of early retirement. I had no idea. There were three shifts at work release. First shift handled the morning, the busiest time of the day, and organized the vans and the carpools that took our inmates to work. They monitored their GPS tracking and generally fielded phone calls and questions from the brass or family members. Second shift was responsible for the logistics of bringing everyone home, coordinating arrivals, and making sure that by the time third shift arrived at 11, everyone was snug in bed and dreaming about tomorrow's busy day. That's where my shift comes in. Third shift. Third shift was, by far, the easiest of the three shifts. You sat behind a desk for eight hours and watched the GPS points for the day run by on a big monitor. You monitored recorded phone calls, called in the counts to the control room, and try not to fall asleep. And other than that, not much happens. Third shift is also the only shift with just one person at the helm, mostly because you don't have to deal with anyone until the sun rises, unless there's an emergency. I'd ridden the 11 to 7 shift for three months and have to say that it was the best post I had ever had. I had to run chow at 4 a.m. and send three groups of loggers out at 5.30, but other than that, I rarely ever saw an inmate unless I wanted to. That's probably how I lost my focus. I was out on a compound check when I first noticed the sound. Every night, at midnight, I have to walk the compound and make sure everything is locked up. Aside from two dorms, there's a tool shop, a laundry room, a chemical shed, a motor pool, and a lawn shed where we keep the lawnmowers and weed eaters. It's also important to walk around and make sure grounds are free of garbage or that no one has tried to drop off any care packages during the day. I've been told that people will sometimes do drug drops when all the inmates are at work, so we walk around periodically and check the drainage ditches and look for turned up turf that someone's hidden things under. I was walking the grounds with my headphones on, listening to Spotify as I made my way around the ground when a harsh noise cut into my music. It sounded like TV static, or the high hum of power lines. And I took my headphones off to clean the jack, thinking they were the culprit. When I slid them off, I realized that it wasn't the headphone. The sound was coming from the yard. Figuring it was an extra energetic cicada, I kept making my way around as I tried to find the source. By the time I had checked the last shed, the noise had stopped. I walked back in and set about the difficult task of finding something to watch on YouTube in between hourly rounds. An hour later, I was sitting with my feet on the desk and listening to a creepy reading when something caught my eye on the monitors. Most of the compound is wired with cameras. One in the kitchen, one in each dorm, one in each of the sheds, and five that sit at various locations around the outside. One of them faces the only road in. Another sits on the parking lot, and the other two face the wreck yard in the backwoods. I looked at the cameras again, sure I had seen something blip across the back cameras. 
and nearly flipped my chair when I caught sight of the wreck yard cam. Someone was standing in the wreck yard, right in the middle of the basketball court, looking at the woods. The center was once a lumber camp, and it's pretty far back in the woods. There's only one access road, and I hadn't seen anyone drive up to it. We don't get a lot of foot traffic out here. The signs on the road are usually enough to deter visitors, so the idea that someone had just walked out of the woods and into my wreck yard was hard to believe. I unlocked the cage where we kept the shotguns and headed out nonetheless. It wasn't an inmate. They were all locked down for the night, so it had to be someone from outside the camp. I came out a side door, barrel leading, and peeked around the edge to get an idea of what I was dealing with. They were still there, standing on the blacktop and staring at the woods. They were tall, around six feet, and a hood obscured their face. The spotlight on the court showed me jeans and sneakers, and I began to think it might be a man. I crept quietly to the tool shed, swinging around, and after a count of three, leveling the barrel at him as I challenged him in my loudest voice. This is penitentiary property. You are not allowed to be here. State your business before I... Before I pointed my shotgun at an empty basketball court. I swept the barrel around, trying to listen for footfalls or heavy breathing. The guy had been there one minute and been gone the next, so if he were still here, I should be able to hear him. There was nowhere he could have made it to in the two seconds it had taken me to come around the shed, and I was certain he had been there. I had seen him, the camera had seen him, and I started walking around the sheds as I tried to flush him out, challenging him every few minutes as I did so. Thirty minutes later, I had to accept that he had gotten away. The cameras, though. I made my way back to the control room, opening the door with my key, and sat down in front of the camera bank. I should have called Stragview, which is only about a mile up the road but I wanted something more concrete than my word on it. The fact that he had disappeared had shaken me, and I needed someone else to have seen him. I rolled back the footage by an hour, panning forward slowly as I checked for figures. Maybe the camera would show me where he'd gone, too. I could go back out and find him, cover him until backup could get here, and have a little excitement for a change. When I got to the point where I had noticed him on the camera, though, the blacktop was empty. I kept watching, thinking maybe I had been wrong. But when I rounded the corner with my shotgun a few minutes later, I rewound and looked again. There was no one there. The court was empty until I got there. But I knew I had seen someone on the camera. Hell, I had seen him when I rounded that shed. How could he just not be there now? There would be no more YouTube for me that night. I bird-dogged those cameras, my eyes sliding from screen to screen, trying to catch anything that might vindicate what I'd seen earlier. I knew what I'd seen. I had seen a person out there. But there was nothing there now. The longer I went, though, the more I second-guessed myself. Maybe it had been a shadow, perhaps I had been seeing things, and maybe I had just wanted there to be something there. I was looking at the yard when something blipped near the woods. I was used to seeing raccoons or possums as they went about their business, maybe even an owl or a hawk, but whatever this was had been big. I panned around to the other camera and thought I saw a similar large shape lapping around near the woods. It was too big to be a dog, maybe a mastiff, but I suppose it could be a large cat or something. We did get bears and cougar sightings every now and again, but on top of the prowler, this was too weird. But when the courtesy phone rang, I nearly jumped out of my skin. The guy on the other end sounded as scared as I was. Officer, it's, uh, it's Tavish. We got a problem out here. The courtesy phone was how the inmates contacted me after the doors were locked. If one of them had a medical emergency or a fight broke out, that was how they got in touch with me. I had only heard it ring a few times, and mostly it was because I was late opening the door for Chow. 
Today, however, the guy on the other end sounded pretty scared. As scared as I felt, in fact. What's going on? Well, something big ran past the window, like a cougar or something. And now there's a loud sound on the roof. The roof? What's on the roof? I asked. I don't know, sir. It sounds pretty big, and it's... But suddenly there was a loud ripping sound from overhead, and I heard the caller scream overtopped by the same static I had heard earlier. I slammed the phone into the cradle and picked up my shotgun as I turned towards the dorm. It took two steps for logic to rear its head, and I realized that charging off without letting someone know what was going on was a great way to end up dead. I picked up the phone again, dialing the number for the control room of Stragview, praying that they weren't having some kind of problems as well. Someone picked up on the second ring. Stragview Reception Center, Control Room Sergeant Cleese speaking. I gave Cleese a short rundown on what was happening, and he assured me that he would send some officers around to help me. Just don't leave the control room. Lock the doors and stay put until we get there. ETA is probably about 15 minutes, but it could be half an hour. We are majorly understaffed tonight. Do I need to call the police as well? Maybe the... No. Cleese came back quickly and decisively. We will handle this. Stay put and don't do anything stupid. Then he hung up. And I swear I could hear that weird static creeping in again before I too hung up. I went around and made sure the doors were locked and tried to keep myself from moving towards the back. I was very curious about what was going on in the dorm, and I found myself walking towards the kitchen before thinking better of it. I should, after all, go make sure the kitchen was secured. It backed into the rec yard, and the dorms were beyond that, so if the doors weren't locked, something might get in. I had slid the key into the lock that separated the offices from the kitchen when I heard the frantic pounding of fists. I threw the door open and saw a handful of scared inmates at the back door of the kitchen. They were pounding on the glass hard enough to send cracks through it, and some of them were looking behind them with terrified, jerking glances. Some of them stepped back when they saw the shotgun, but pounded with more fervor when they saw I was holding it. Please, let us in. These things are going to kill us. I glanced out the back window over the drop sink and saw an abattoir spread across the blacktop I had walked on only a few hours before. The overhead lights near the woods and over the blacktop had burst. I could see large, loping shapes chasing scared inmates in the semi-darkness before burying them and taking them to the ground. Their screams were a cacophony and I was surprised I was only now hearing, and in the middle of it all stood the hooded man. He turned then, his eyes meeting mine through the window, and I heard the din of screams dim as though it were a bad radio signal. His eyes bore into mine, and I could feel him root around in my brain like fingers over my scalp. The inmates at the door kept shrieking, but I hardly noticed when something came along and drugged them away. Many of the things seemed to be dragging my inmates towards the woods, but the man in the hood commanded my full attention. When he spoke in my head, it didn't even seem odd at the time. We don't want you, Watchman. Sleep and live to tell your friends what you have seen here. Oh, and be sure to give the Warden a special message for me. Be sure to tell him that Reese is back. I wasn't aware of anything else until someone slapped me across the face, and I realized I was on the ground. Now I'm in a holding cell back at the prison, awaiting the warden while he compiles a report from the work camp. From what I've been told by the yard sergeant, a blunt man who came to interrogate me like a freaking inmate, all the inmates at the center are gone. I told him about the things, about the man and about the bodies and the blood out on the wreck yard, but they don't believe me. The sergeant says that they haven't found any blood or bodies there. The only person they found was me, asleep on the floor after making a disturbing call to the prison about someone attacking the work camp. 
The doors to the dorms were opened, a lock's missing, and they expect that there is now a roving band of inmates out in the Stragview woods. The only person that seemed to believe me was the warden, and he's out there now. When I first came here, he met me at the gate, asking me what had happened and what I had seen. I told him everything. I told him about the big creatures, things like hunting cats that had broken into the dorm, and the blips on the cameras I'd seen as they moved around. I told him about the phone call from inmate Tabish, where he told me about the creatures trying to get into the dorm and the static bursts as they had made it inside. Somehow. I told him about the man in the hood, even giving him the message that he had left for him. That was when the warden's carefully constructed cool had evaporated. Hold him until I get back. I will have more questions for him. I'm writing this down in my notebook so I don't forget it, so that if I ever get out, I can give it to someone and make sure it's seen. Something is going on in the woods around Stragview, and if I ever get to leave, I can promise you I will never be coming back again. Whoever Reese is, he has returned. And whoever Reese is, he's coming back for blood. <laughs>